Welcome to Blade of Tech Musings, the channel dedicated to retro tech, innovation, science, and technological entertainment. August 15th, 1927, a manned single-stage spacecraft, no name or designation, was test-fired from a stand situated near Morling Avenue in Baltimore, Maryland, on or about this date. The rocket successfully fired its engine, but failed to achieve sufficient thrust to lift before fuel ran out. Nevertheless, it was the first known attempt to test-fire a liquid-fueled rocket of any substantial size. Famous rocket pioneer Robert Goddard had launched the first liquid-fueled rocket a year before, but Goddard's vehicle was much smaller, under 100 pounds versus an excess of 1,000 pounds for the Baltimore rocket. It would be nine years before a rocket of comparable size, the German A3, would be test-fired, and 18 years before another manned rocket was launched, the German Bachem BA349, which killed its pilot. So from where did the Baltimore Rocketeer draw his design ideas? Was it Clark University's Robert Goddard? Goddard had prophylactically patented a design for a multi-stage rocket that could use either solid or liquid fuel in 1914, which meant that the idea of such a rocket was in the public domain. The physicists subsequently began conducting solid rocket engine tests in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1915, and by 1921, was working on liquid fuel rocket engines, activity that had drawn the attention of national newspapers. Despite the widespread publicity, after the fact analysis makes it plain that the Baltimore Rocketeer was unaware of Goddard's work, or at least the important details underlying Goddard's successful experiments. Romanian German physicist Hermann Oberth's 1923 landmark text, The Rocket into Interplanetary Space, was found among the Rocketeer's personal effects decades later suggesting that there was some scientific basis underpinning the Baltimore rocket. Still, it is clear that the 1927 test fire was a unique standalone event. So why don't science texts make mention of the Baltimore Rocketeer in the same breath as Robert Goddard? Why isn't there a satellite or interplanetary probe named after this individual? Or perhaps even a launch complex at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station? What happened to the rocket and what happened to the designer that would cause them to be erased from history? Let's find out. The name of the Baltimore Rocketeer is well rooted in fact. His name was Robert Condit, and not only did he design and build the 1927 rocket, he acted as his own pilot, not wanting anyone else to take the risk that something catastrophic would occur, which was certainly more than just a trivial possibility. He also self-sourced the funds for the construction, a cost that likely ran into the thousands of dollars. Condit was a graduate of the Baltimore Polytechnic Institute, a vocational trade school about four miles from Morling Avenue in the city center. BPI was founded in 1883 as an engineering school, but by 1912, approximately when Condit entered the institution, BPI's role was firmly cemented as a high school level secondary school. There is no evidence that Condit attended a college, so his educational level certainly fell short of Goddard's, whose education at the Worcester Polytechnic Institute was for a baccalaureate degree, and then a master's and PhD at Clark University. Still. Anecdotal comments from newspaper accounts and relatives all suggested Condit was quite bright, a mathematical genius even, and few doubted that he could have taken a legitimate crack at rocket construction. With Oberth's text in hand, all he needed was time and money, something that he had managed to accumulate after graduating from BPI during World War I. Condit labored at various jobs in order to save money for his dream of building a rocket, including working as an artist's model. The bootstrap engineer was by all accounts a charismatic and good-looking young man, a fact that no doubt aided him in his pursuits. As a BPI graduate, it is likely that he spent his 20s as junior management or as a foreman in the factories that were plentiful in the city. It was the roaring 20s, and there was plenty of opportunity for resourceful individuals. In December of 1926, he began construction of the rocket with the help of two neighborhood friends and brothers, Harry Euler and Sterling Euler. The Eulers supported themselves as stonemason and carpenter, respectively, but had a background in metal fabrication more than equal to the task of constructing Condit's design. It is assumed the Eulers also funded some of the rocket's construction, although neither brother ever specified the scope of any financial contribution to reporters or relatives. The rocket was about 15 feet high and 4 feet in diameter. The craft was piloted from a small compartment in the nose, which was just large enough to accommodate Condit's big frame when he crouched inside. 
The compartment was accessed through a hatch on the nose of the rocket. On that warm August day in 1927, Condit squeezed into the rocket. The Eulers and the crowd that had gathered to watch stepped back, and he threw the switch that started the rocket's single engine. The engine fired smoothly, and fiery exhaust exited the eight tubes that were the engine's nozzles, billowing everywhere, including the nearby street, forcing traffic to stop. Harry Euler later recounted the event in an article in the September 21, 1969 edition of the Baltimore Sun. I never saw so much fire in my life, said Euler. Big blooms of red flame boiled out around the spacecraft, and big clouds of black smoke rolled up into the sky. Condit had just wanted to take her up maybe a quarter of a mile or so, Euler continued. Let her hang there in the air until he got the feel of her, and then lower down to load up with more fuel for the real trip. Unfortunately, Condit never left the ground. He continued to feed more and more fuel to the engine, but the rocket still would not lift. Finally, he threw the throttle wide open, and the engine roared deafeningly, but it was no use. The fuel finally ran out, and the engine sputtered and died. The test fire was over. The crowd faded away, and traffic on Morling Avenue resumed. A few gawkers were left to stare at Condit's rocket, the metal popping and pinging with residual heat. Condit was disappointed, but not discouraged. What he needed, obviously, was a second stage underneath the original first stage, with a larger engine and more fuel to achieve the necessary thrust. The erstwhile engineer and the two Eulers sat down and did some calculations. When they were finally done with the figures, it was not promising. Condit figured he needed another $30,000 and another year to build the second stage. The original rocket had taken eight months to build and it consumed a good chunk of Condit's funds, plus what the Eulers had contributed in terms of labor and materials. The Eulers decided at this point that they were out of the project. Furthermore, the city of Baltimore had likely made its displeasure clear with Condit regarding the disruption to traffic and the fire danger to surrounding structures. A frustrated Condit threw up his hands and left for a few weeks while the rocket was stowed in a garage. Condit returned with a truck, loaded the rocket onto it, and left. The Eulers never saw him again. What happened from there is a little murky, but what is known is that Condit hired a shipper to transport the rocket to Miami Beach. Once there, he set up shop as a rocketeer in waiting and tried to raise the funds he needed, making it known that he intended on launching his rocket in 1928. But as an additional enticement to the public, not only did he announce that he would reach space in his craft, he stated that he hoped to reach Venus. With this claim, Condit caught the attention of newspapers by December of 1927, who were more than happy to pen fantastic screed on some crazy who was going to launch himself off the Earth. Condit, grinning with confidence, was more than happy to oblige. He predicted that his first launch would occur on January 24th and filled the scribbling newspaper reporter's ears with pseudoscience technobabble on how he planned to get off his own planet and visit another. It was not clear to anyone why Condit had left Baltimore for Miami to continue his experiments. He told a news service that he had moved to South Florida because the 26th latitude is where the cosmic magnetism, on which he depends, exerts its greatest effect. What is more likely is what Condit didn't say. Miami Beach was as close to the equator he could get with his rocket in order to take advantage of the rotational speed of Earth. More speed meant less fuel he had to put in the rocket. January 24, 1928 came and went, and still there was no launch. Condit still needed money. He tried to charge a mission to the crowds of onlookers milling around the building he stored his rocket, but he couldn't get the city aldermen to approve it. Local businessmen considered Condit's rocket claim ludicrous and declined to partner with the engineer. Meanwhile, Goddard was having more success than Condit in attracting funding. It wasn't that the Massachusetts physicist was considered less of a nut than Condit. Both men were widely made fun of in the papers. The difference was that Goddard had started small and had proven rocket and engine designs that could be demonstrated to anyone trustworthy enough to command a viewing. The Smithsonian Institution had stepped in to fund Goddard in the early 1920s, and Goddard was able to cobble enough money from the U.S. Army and from Clark University to continue through the remainder of the decade. He tinkered away, continuously making progress on his designs. A visit from Charles Lindbergh in 1929 led to an introduction to the philanthropic Guggenheim family, who awarded Goddard a significant grant in 1930 to step up his research. Back in 1928, Condit labored in futility to get enough money to build a second stage for his rocket. 
Reporters cross-checked his claims with astronomers and physicists at some prominent universities, and they all scoffed. Condit's plan to visit Venus, which is the nearest planet at 24 million miles in its closest approach, was labeled as ridiculous, never mind his prospects in getting off the planet he was on. It was pointed out that food, heat, and oxygen were a problem, as well as navigation. It was all well and good to launch a cylinder in a direct line off the surface of the Earth, but what to do from there? Eventually, the reporters and the crowds drifted away, leaving Condit alone with his original rocket prototype and no way to move forward. He pushed off the launch date into the summer of 1928 and then to the spring of 1929, all the while hustling for attention. It all came to an end with the September crash of the stock market. Condit ran out of money and the rocket was likely seized for bills and sold for scrap. With the onset of the Great Depression, both Robert Condit and his rocket disappeared, never to be mentioned other than in Harry Euler's 1969 Baltimore Sun article at newspapers or magazines again. Goddard continued to labor over his rocket designs throughout the 1930s, receiving little attention from the U.S. government other than a few far-seeing military officers. In 1944, Germany started launching thousands of V-1 and V-2 rockets into Britain. This finally made the U.S. government sit up straight and take notice, and from that point, Goddard's services were in great demand. But it was too little, too late. Goddard, who had been in frail health since an early bout of tuberculosis in 1913, developed a throat cancer in 1945. He died that same year in Condit's childhood town, Baltimore. We touched on Robert Goddard's contribution to space exploration in episode 31 about the VPOAD calculator and in Milestones 5 for the date of July 17th. The link to both videos can be found below. Goddard's death likely contributed to Werner von Braun's rise to prominence in the U.S. space program. We discussed von Braun's history in Milestone 7 for the date of July 27th, and in Episode 30 about SpaceX's success in developing the Dragon 2. The link to both those videos can also be found below. That would probably be the end of the story of Robert Condit, but for the enduring mythos that surrounded the 1927 rocket test in Baltimore. The incident was widely known in the city, so much so that a restaurant called Rocket to Venus, an homage to the story opened in 2006, less than a mile from Morling Avenue. The extended Euler family visited the restaurant fairly often, which then drew the attention of a documentary filmmaker. After getting more details from the Eulers, the filmmaker decided that finding the rocket itself would make a good documentary, and he set out to do just that. Details about Condit began to dribble out. It turned out that Condit did not die during the Great Depression or World War II as many had suspected, but rather in a seedy roadside motel in 1971 while on a road trip to see his sister Elizabeth in Miami. A descendant, who ironically fabricates components for satellites and space probes as a profession, surfaced with a bag full of Condit's old papers. The satchel was a treasure trove of late 1920s letters and business documents, but nothing dated after 1929. What occurred between 1929 and 1971 remains a mystery. WBAL-TV in Baltimore caught wind of the documentary in 2019 and ran a story, although new details on Condit were lacking. Nevertheless, this was enough to spark interest in a lifestyle freelance writer based in Baltimore whose essay about Condit appeared in the July 26, 2020 issue of the Washington Post magazine. The writer's style is New Yorker magazine, and the essay is laced with words and phrases like zeitgeist and lack the chops and scrappy weirdness. Much of the article is spent on background, which, to be fair, is most of what's available concerning the Condit story. Unfortunately, there are also a few silly inaccuracies. The writer got taken in by the oft-repeated legend that Condit's rocket lifted 100 feet off the ground, which, regrettably, never happened. The essay mulls over the possible genius of Condit using a liquid-fueled rather than a solid-fuel rocket engine, although it is likely the engineer was more concerned about the likelihood of killing himself with solid explosive used as fuel, the technology for which was not fully wrung out until the space shuttle program 50 years later. And manned spaceflight to Mars is dismissed as being far-fetched, although the prospect for such an expedition was technically feasible as early as the 1960s. 
On the plus side, the essay is reasonably entertaining, which is probably the point. It might be a link in the chain that will finally drag Condit's entire story from the murky depths of history. We salute Robert Condit's moxie and vision, which but for a little more science, technology, and the practical experience of a couple decades, could have become at least a partial reality. If there is an update to Condit's story, we will be sure to revisit it. What do you think of Robert Condit's Rocket to Venus? How much is fable and how much is fact? Share with us by dropping a comment below. We hope you enjoyed this 39th episode on the BTM channel. If so, click that like button. Not a subscriber yet? Clicking the subscribe button and the bell notification icon will help both our YouTube standing and keep you informed when new episodes are released. Links to our previous episodes can be found below. Stay connected by occasionally checking our Instagram feed where we post content from our upcoming episodes and from episodes past that you may have missed. Make sure you follow our Twitter account where all new episodes are announced. And finally, join us on our Facebook page where we cover current news and events related to channel content. Thanks for watching.